Hi guys, how are you doing? My name is Eddie Ludlow. I'm the founder of the Whiskey Lounge. I hope you're all well. Uh, I'm here to um, introduce to you the video tasting for the Indie Bottlers Whiskey Tasting Pack. Um, now, we actually recorded uh, a session back in October for our festival in a box in which we used the same whiskies. However, for that tasting, we had all six presenters on representing each of the whiskies and talking about each of the whiskies. And I felt it much more valuable for you to be able to see this, um, as each of those people has much better knowledge and insight into their own whiskey. Um, now, you will notice there's quite a lot of banter between myself and the presenters and each other, um, because it genuinely is six, uh, seven friends just chatting about whiskey, uh, as well as going into detail about each of the whiskies. Now, the other thing to note is that you might see some scrolling offers on the screen. Uh, now, obviously, these were applicable back then in October. Um, so the prices may have changed. The um, the discount at House of Malt has expired, I'm afraid, and it was specifically for that uh, Festival in a Box uh, session. Um, but you may still be able to buy the whiskies, which is obviously good news. Anyway, without further ado, I shall let you enjoy this video, and I will see you at the very end. So slander and enjoy, everyone. Thank you. Um, delighted to say that we're here to do the Indie Bottlers uh, session, and we've actually got all of our presenters here, which is a bit of a miracle. Um, you can see them all on the screen there in the gloriousness. Um, I'm going to send most of them away as we talk to each one one by one, um, but you'll see them all again a little bit later. So say hi bye. Hi bye. Hi bye. Hi bye. <laughs> All right, so uh, for those who don't know me, my name's Oliver Chilton. I work for Elixir Distillers. We're um, an independent bottler, hence the reason we're in this pack, um, i.e. we buy casks of whiskey and put them in bottle. You probably already know all that, so I'll let someone go into more detail later on rather than wasting my time there. Um, Elixir Distillers is uh, owned by a guy called Sukhinder Singh, um, who owns a small online shop um, you may have heard of. Uh, there are bottles that are sold everywhere, including on the lovely um, House of Malt. Um, and Alex Distillers, as a kind of conceptual idea, as a, as a part of Sikinda's hobby, started in 2002, at least 2000, early 2000s, when he bottled his first cask of whiskey. And the whiskey I'm going to show you today is from our Single Malt of Scotland series, which uh, the first label came out in 2002. Um, it's gone through lots of changes over that time. so. Originally, it was just buying a cask of whiskey, buying a cask of whiskey, much like with the other small independent bottler. Um, during the kind of mid 2000s, we did like batches of whiskey, so two, three casks at a time. Um, and then in 2013, when I, I moved over to this side of the business, I used to work in the shops um, into kind of buying casks and putting them in bottles. I was far too nervous to blend anything together, so we, we went back to single casks. Um, however, as time has gone on, and as I've been buying casks now for uh, probably not even half as long as most of the people on this chat, um, a few years, we've kind of gained in confidence as a business and we started looking more at putting stuff together. So the first whiskey we're trying is a, is a Glen Elgin 2007. It's part of our reserve casks uh, range, which is kind of our entry level. It's where we, where we kind of convert you from buying standard single malt whiskey uh, to independently bottle single malt whiskey. Um, I'm always chuffed to be part of these kind of panel things because for me, independent bottling, you, you can't live on your own. Um, my background is all uh, in retail, so flogging bottles to people. And, it, and it's always a struggle to explain the concept of they don't own a distillery, they buy casks and they put it in a bottle and, and they put their approval on it or, or however you want to present it. And it's always difficult if you're just explaining one company. I was, I was like, see, as a family, um, we were doing very similar jobs, doing similar things, and essentially buying from the same places. Um, this particular bottle that we've got is a parcel of four casks, four hogsheads, uh, all distilled at Glen Elgin in 2007. We actually bought uh, much bigger parcels, so we all buy kind of 10, 20, 30 casks at a time from the distillery in a vintage, and we'll work our way. Um, drink our way through all of those samples to find the ones that 
either stand out on their own or work better together or need more time. Um, so reserve tasks is where we put our kind of parcels where you definitely find some tasks need a bit of help um, sometimes from the task next door. Um, we reduce them to 48%. We do 48% very simply because I like to drink 48%. Uh, it's the alcohol is low enough that you can you can chug it. That's probably not responsible drinking, is it? But you can sip it uh, nicely without uh, thinking, well, that's hot. Um, and it maintains enough alcohol that it still be runs your filters. You don't have to have colouring. For those that have got the pack and are watching this, you'll notice the colour of the whiskey um, is quite light. Uh, it's all from refill American oak. Uh, quite careful with the term. So they were probably at one point bourbon barrels that were then broken down, their stage broken down and turned into a 250 litre cask or the hogshead. Uh, they will have contained whiskey several times before. Most of the time when, when I go look at these casks there, before filling they're 10, anywhere between 10 and 20 years of age. So, you know, the, the wood's pretty well used. Um, there are positives, negative stuff. Negative, obviously, you don't get all the vanilla, you don't get all the sweet and stuff that uh, for some makes works really well. Um, but the positive is that you can really taste the make. So if you've got a really good quality make, um, has really lovely characters, uh, which I, I believe Fair Nagin is, you can really kind of taste uh, what people who made the spirit were doing. Um, Glen Elgin, I should tell you a little bit about the actual whiskey. Glen Elgin um, is a very old established distillery, mainly used in blends, historically used in blends, historically used in White Horse. Um, and it's owned by the biggest distiller of them all, Diageo. They make a, an interesting kind of juxtaposition of a spirit. Because it's, to me, it's always quite apple, it's quite light in, in some respects. But it's also got a certain weight to it. And they've got um, uh, worm tough condensers on, which tend to result in heavier spirits. Um, but it's not kind of your kind of sulfuric heavy, more wacky style. It's more of it's, it's more elegant than that. Um, and that's why for me you can bottle it relatively young. So this was bottled start of the year, so I think it's 13 years of age. Um, and I think it really shines in the glass. For me. Um, I hate doing old tasting it things at the end of the day, it's what you try but for me. I do get kind of apples, I get that kind of baked apples, baked apple tart, um, which it, hopefully I find very Moorish. Um, as I said, 48% means that we can drink it quite easily, I hope. Um, and it also, as I said earlier, it may, means that we don't have to chill filter it. So if you add any water to this, it will go cloudy. Um, that is just the fats, uh, basically, lots of compounds coming together. Uh, that perforate and make it go hazy. Um, but as everybody knows, everybody likes to cook, and everyone look at me now can tell fats are good. Um, you want fats. They create texture, they create body. So we, and I think everybody in the lineup today um, does not chill filter. I believe Mark has quite strong views on it, but I'm sure he'll share. Did I talk fast enough? Did I get through that 10 minutes, anyway? He did very well, Ollie. Well done, well done. Um, it's a it's a lovely uh, kind of breakfast dram. I think the uh, this this Glen Elgin it's really light and perfumey and soft and supple. Um, what I was going to ask you as a independent bottler is as, as pr pretty much what you're doing full time now. Obviously, that wasn't always the case, but that's what you do and have done for quite a bit. What's the favourite part of your your job? What's the most rewarding part of your job? It's really funny, isn't it? Because I actually really enjoy the spreadsheets, but I'm probably not supposed to say that. Um, <laughs> supposed to say the drinking the car samples. It's really not. I mean, I, I have to build up to that some weeks because quite often what you're drinking is utterly utter shy. Um, I think the most enjoyable things to people, like obviously, it's great when we're getting out to meet customers and all, all that's great fun because essentially I'm speaking to people like myself. There's something quite nice in that. Um, but actually what I really like is the other people in the industry. So pretty much everyone on the chat today, or everybody on the chat today, I've had many drams and beers with, um, and that's the kind of whiskey industry thing. You, you get to know everyone, but I kind of feel like independent bottling, you're a subset. So, you, you know, some distillers look down on you from on high, like some yeah. kind of, uh, so you end up kind of grouping together. So, you know, I've, I've been in 
compromising positions with everybody in this chat at one point or another. Uh, so I would say that that's pretty much my my favorite thing about it. Um, outside of that, I think the, the best thing about independent bowling overall is the range of stuff. You know, having your own distillery, I'm, I'm very jealous of those people who have their own distillery and get to make spirit. That, that would be fantastic. Mm. However, there's something lovely about working with everybody else's. Um, you get to sit to one side and you get to be quite critical, which I am um, sometimes probably too critical. Um, you know, you get to be a, an, an armchair you know, warrior on, on whiskey, but you also get to spend money on it in kind of big, big ways. Um, when you find stuff that's really good, you can research why it's really good and you can use that. I, I love the fact that I can use my hobby as a, as a way to buy whiskey. Uh, but in a much bigger scale and put it in bottles. So as an example, when we find a particular vintage of a particular mate, um, I'll then sometimes go back and I'll go and speak to the people just to try and find out why it was nice. And, and then I turn that into a reason to buy more whiskey. Um, so yeah, I guess those are the kind of the elements. I love the, the, the choice. Um, I also just love the people you get to work with. Okay, I'm going to bring in now a... Um... Uh, well, these are these are all some of my favourite people, to be honest, and and that goes for everyone this weekend. But um, I'm going to bring on a real character in the industry. Um, it sh should maybe come with a slight kind of health advice label on his shirt or something, because this man is uh, is capable of of, of all manner of uh, getting you in awful states. Um, so I'm going to bring in uh, Mark Watt. I hope I hope you take that as a complete compliment, as it was meant to be. Um, in, in fairness, actually, I do. It's... <laughs> <laughs> Although, I don't know. I think a lot of the time it's the blind leading the blind, particularly, again, with everyone that's in this chat. You know, I might get the blame, but, you know, you can bring a horse to water. But uh... Yeah, okay, I know. I know I, I'm, I'm, I'm a fine one to talk is basically what you're trying to say. <laughs> it's all good. Fella. Well, this... So, yeah, so I'm, for those of you who don't know, I'm Mark Watt. Uh, myself and my wife, Kate, we... Recently founded Watt Whiskey. We are Scotland's fastest growing whiskey company. And that we went from zero bottles to selling 10 bottles this week. But uh, yeah, we've just set up our own independent bottling company. So it's really a privilege for, for me to be included in this tasting with such great companies and great people. Um, we've just launched our first five casks. Um, we we wanted to be to have our own company for a long time potentially, but never really thought about it. And then things came together, and we thought let let's give it a try. And so we have done. And we've been very lucky that we, you know, between myself and Kate, we've had forty years experience in the industry. Uh, I've had thirty nine of them. Kate's had one. No, I'm only joking. Um, and we've been very lucky to work with our contacts quite a lot to get things happening. Uh, I've previously worked for Caddenheads, obviously, and Duncan Taylor, so always worked with people who had their own bottling hole. Um, so basically, I'm just doing the same job as I've always done, but now with, uh, with our, our own money, which makes it much more difficult, although obviously we had the crowdfunder, which helped, helped a lot, and that was fantastic. Uh, the support that we've had has been amazing, which has allowed us to start with five casks, and one of the casks that we started on was this uh, Manic Moor. Um, you'll see there the taste bud, and also from our T-shirt company that we've set up. Uh, we are very much focused on being all about the taste, um, so everything we do is all all about the taste and things that we like. Um, so we've done a lot of things that I probably wouldn't have wanted to do when I first started off, like having boxes and things. I wanted to be, right, we'll have a bottle. And we'll maybe put a label on it, and that'll be it. Um, but obviously, we, we we've had to fold to commercial reasons or whatever. But it it, it does look good. Um, so the logo is is a taste bud because we're we're all about the taste. Um, and this manic more is one of the first five casts we did, and we bought this cask by accident, um, which is not one hundred percent true, but is true. When we got the samples, we've been very lucky again having good. Um, Good connections in the whiskey industry. You know, we've bought casks from six different sources so far, which is not bad, I think. Um, we got a list 
and there was a Manic Moore 2000 and whatever year it is, 2008 on the list. And I thought, oh, I'll get a sample of that. I quite fancy that. In fairness, Kate was like, Manic Moore? Yeah. Uh, again, this is like, um, like Ollie's Glen Elgin. Not the greatest of names. You know, there's no Glen Elgin collectors. There's, I was going to say there's no Manic Moore collectors, but there is one. Ulf, if you're watching, nice to see you. Um, but I, I always quite like Manic Moore, and I know Manic Moore from around 2008 is quite good. Got the sample, tried it. Thought, lovely, lovely mouthfeel. Nice, rich and creamy. And then we ordered the cask, and then we're told, oh, see that hogshead that you ordered? It's not a hogshead. It's two hogsheads that have been married together and put into a brandy butt. Um, so there was actually 600 and... 63 bottles in the cask. Now, had I seen on the list that it had been finished in a brandy butt um, for three months, I wouldn't have asked for a sample. I would have been like, nah, you're all right, move it on. Uh, generally speaking, I'm all about like finishes are, you know, a year and a half, two years, allow things to get integrated. But we love this whiskey and we, I wouldn't say we took a punt on it, but we loved it and we thought, what will we do? Will we buy it? Will we buy half of it? And we went for the mental option of starting a new company with a manic 663 bottles of manic more. Now, probably I don't think anyone's ever sold 663 bottles of manic more before. Um, but again, it comes down to what we're all about. It's it's the taste, the the quality, the mouthfeel. Um, did the brandy butt add to it? I think it did, but I don't know because. I'd never tried it before it went into the brandy butt. But I do think it's probably given it a bit more richness and a bit more mouthfeel coming through in, in the whiskey. And that's that's what we're all about. And we we it's been strange. I've always worked for companies where I've been allowed to say what I want, to be honest. Um or more or less. Um so now we really can be honest. Um not that it wasn't before, as you all know. Uh, but we want to be as transparent as possible, so we tell people what it is. It would be easy enough for us to say this is just a brandy cask finish and not tell people, but we tell people the complete full details. Uh, if we can tell people, we'll be transparent as possible. Sometimes we can't. You know, we bought a cask of, I very nearly said the distillery name, um, that we weren't allowed to bottle, weren't allowed to put on in the bottle, But so we bottled that as a, as a Highland or whatever. But when we can um, tell you what it is, we will. So this whiskey has probably changed my views that I will now um, look into things that have had shorter finishes, perhaps. Um, but finishes are not what we're all about. It was just that we happen to really love this one. And I think hopefully those of you who are tasting along will enjoy it as well. Uh, not as good as Haig, though. Well, one of the best adverts about Haig is don't, you know, don't be vague as for Haig. I can't think of a rhyme for Manic more, but just give me some more. Um, but it's it's one of these things I, I, I really like. And we're looking forward to doing more and more casks. Uh, we've started with five. The hope is we do uh, four releases a year of five or six casks. You know, we're not looking to take over the world. Um, we're just wanting to bought some good whiskey, make enough money to pay the mortgage. Um, and and that you know and have some fun while doing it and you know we've been lucky a lot of people have said this oh starting a new independent bowling is it's very difficult it's very hard and yeah it, it is um but the hardest thing we found is working with couriers um you know but again people forget that we've had you know 20 years in the industry i've been i've been doing this for a long time uh so it's it's nice and the the whole thing about what whiskey we Cheers, Julie. We, okay, everyone knows me. I've got a massive ego, and wow. let's just put my name on it. We didn't want to do that. We we came up with the idea of calling the company the Camelton Whiskey Company Limited because the name was available, and it's too good a name not to have. And then looking into the labeling issues, if you have the name of a region on your label, you can't then use any other whiskey from any other region. So therefore, our design team, our London design team, did you ever think I would say that? Um, came up with the idea of pushing the Watt brand and Watt whiskey, and obviously we've got Watt rum. 
and then in the future, who knows? But the philosophy, like everyone that's on here tonight, non-chill filtered, natural colour. You know, we're being honest. We we don't have rules of money. We will we're doing all right. Um, but we've got we own. I was going to say we own fifteen casks. We don't. We own ten because we bottled five of them. Um, we don't have huge amounts uh, of casks that we can do, but we're looking to lay down in the future. But at the minute, we're buying and bottling. That, that's pretty much us in a nutshell. Um, keep it small, keep it happy, and just drink good whiskey. Yeah. Well, that's what it's all about, isn't it? <laughs> I was going to just quickly ask you um, the name of the distillery that you couldn't name. I, I, I couldn't possibly name it. Um... <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. I thought I could get round you there. It it's is. Clearly, it's clearly a bit early. But... <laughs> um well, as as you alluded to and have said, and I mentioned earlier on, you know, it's a very young business. I think you only took um, delivery of the first yeah. bottles a fortnight ago, or even less. Um, but the amount of the amount of pride and satisfaction you must have felt when you finally got delivery of those bottles and seeing your name on them. And yeah, I mean, it was really huge. It it was a strange experience for us because, well, for me because I've been buying and selling and bottling and selecting casks for, for a long time. So doing it for herself, it didn't really feel that special because it's just something I've always done. And it wasn't until we got the bottle in our hand, you know, and then the other week I was in the Highland Run in Craigelke and I had a dram of my own whiskey in the pub I learned to drink in. And you're like, mm -hmm. wow. You know, um, and there's lots of people, you know, that we need to thank for that coming to fruition, you know, and... Uh, I think that's where we've been lucky. We've managed to pull on, pull on years of drinks tokens of people. <laughs> Jess, hello, you? hello. Um, <laughs> good to see you. How are you? I'm good. I'm enjoying your um, empty chair next to you. It feels like I could just kind of hop across the screen and sit down. Wow. In my well, uh, you would be you know free to do so, but you're not exactly next door, are you? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, well, to those of you who don't know, um, I am the, we recently decided global representative of Single Cask Nation. Um, there are just three of us in the company um, and we uh, were all Jays. So um, my two bosses, hello if you're watching, Joshua and Jason over in the US. Um, and I am the most recent J. Um, I am Jess, and I guess uh, that's it. We can close the books now. That's um, all the Js we need. So um, if you were going to apply to Single Cast Nation, sorry, can't help you. Um, but to those of you who maybe don't know us, um, Single Cast Nation are an independent bottler. Uh, we have been going for just shy of 10 years now. Um, but maybe the reason most people don't know us is because we have been based in the US until last year. So um, we started in 2011 with an online members um, society. The idea being that it was um, a group of like-minded people who wanted to get together and um, drink delicious whiskies. I like to think we did it quite well. Um, and then we launched a retail <clears throat> arm in 2017. So um, we started making our bottlings available in select retail stores across the US. And then uh, I came on board just, just over a year ago, we started. Um, we had our first release, we actually launched at Glasgow's Whiskey Festival. And um, if you remember the olden days when we could go to festivals and um, shout across tables at each other um, and drink lots of delicious drams. Um, so that's, uh, it really feels like a world away. Um, so we did six uh, bottles in our first release. We had four single malts, a blended malt and a rum, uh, which is probably one of my favorites from that release, um, a 16 year old Trinidadian rum, which was delicious. Uh, and so uh, we had started to plan our second release and then uh, a little pandemic happened. So we are a little bit behind where I was hoping to be for uh, 2020. Um, but what I'm really excited to bring to the Whiskey Lounge and to our festival in a box is a bottle from our new release. In fact, it is 
so new that I don't even have an official label that I can show you. And um, even my bottle under the computer here is a, a bottling line production label. So um, it will be in keeping with the cask that's behind me. And you can see just behind over my shoulder here um, bottles from our first release. So um, you kind of you, you sort of know what we're looking for here. Um, but never mind the labels, and um, we can talk about packaging all day. What's in the bottle, as you've already heard uh, Mark and Ollie say, is the most important bit. So um, I have pre pod my Klein Leash. I hope that if you are drinking along with us, you have also now poured yourself the Klein Leash. Um, this is a uh, 2011, it's, it's a nine year old. Um, it's quite a big punchy dram. So uh, on the nose, I think this is, it's quite typical for me of young Klein Leash. It's not particularly big and farmy and waxy like some of the <clears throat> older Klein Leashes tend to be. To me, this is full of like fruits and um, like a really nice kind of touch of custard. I can see Ollie has said down here, custard cream. Yeah, good, good. Um, to me, this is um, a really great example of allowing a whiskey to shine through. So this is from our refill bourbon, which, Ollie was talking about earlier, allows you to have um, more of the spirit, I guess, shining through. Um, uh, on the palette, I think this is great. It's got lots of kind of oaky juiciness. Um, and I think it's got a slight, an almost spicy feel, like as if you sort of, um, like you've got jalapenos on nachos. It could be because we're getting to that time of day where I'm getting a bit peckish, but um, that's what I've got. Um, and I think it's got a really decent feel. Um, we talk a lot at Single Cast Nation about being all about mouthfeel um, and texture. We're texture guys, which I feel like I'm, an, I'm sort of in uh, okay company here because you guys, if I say we're all about texture, we, we kind of understand what we're talking about here. So we want something that's big and mouth filling. You don't want it to disappear off the palate too quickly. Um, and I think it's got a pretty good lingering fruitiness to it. Um, and I, I think what I really love about this Klein Leash is it's a, a great circular dram. So we come back to where we started from. So we go back to that um, lovely fruitiness and more of those kind of like, um, like sort of, <laughs> this is a weird taste note, like candy necklace sweets. Do you not think it's got that kind of um, like fruit salad, chewy type stuff? So maybe not quite what I would expect from um, a big dirty Klein Leash, but um, I think it's got a lovely sort of fruitiness to it. I could drink this for a long time. No, it's, it's absolutely delicious. And do you know what? Um, I, I, I don't think it needs water. I think it, it, it's just so yummy, you know, really in, that's that intensity. There's a real kind of almost drying spiciness about yeah. it, which I think you'd lose with the, with the drop of water even. Um, so I, I'm going for, for as it comes on this one. I don't know how you feel about that. Um, the first kind of the first couple of times I tried it when we were when I got hold of the samples, um, I added like a tiny splash of water just to dial back some of that pepperiness. But actually, I find that the more I'm kind of getting into it, um, I don't I don't think I need to add water. And um, typically, I tend to not add too much water into my drums anyway, which sometimes gets me into trouble, especially for my <laughs> But um, yeah, I think a lot of our um, bottles, we try to bottle um, whiskies that we think you can drink naturally. And then if you want to add water or whatever you fancy adulterating your whiskey in, we're not snobs here. Um, you know, you can do that too, but it allows you to experience it, you know, naturally. That's what we're looking for too. So like a lot of indie bottlers, we're all about keeping the, we're letting the whiskey do the talking and like letting me witter on here. But you know, keeping the the whiskey in the conversation whilst you're drinking it. Cameron, I thought you were looking for a great bloke, Eddie. Yeah, are we having a candlelit dinner or something? What's going on there? Uh, I'm actually in the the boardroom of the of our shop. Uh, oh, I didn't really see. what I was doing. I thought I would maybe do something a bit special because um, my house is basically a tip just now. So uh, <laughs> I decided to, to go. But the lighting in here is not the best. So yeah. that, unfortunately, no romance is going on here. So you didn't just break in then? No, no, no. I, I, I did actually make sure that uh, somebody knows that I'm here. Um, hi there. Uh, my name's Cameron. I'm a sales manager for Cadenheads, which is Scotland's oldest independent bottler. Um, we're owned by a gentleman called Headley Wright, who is also the chairman of Springbank 
and Glengyle distilleries where the uh, Kilkerran whisky is produced. And we're based in the west coast of Scotland in Campbelltown, which was the former Victorian whisky capital of the world. Um, Caddenheads, um, as I said, we've been bottling whisky since 1842. And part of our ethos is always to be trying to use quality over quantity. Now, as you've been hearing from other guys too, um, independent bottling, um, we are sourcing casks from all around, Scot not just Scotland, but around the world too. And we try and just give our own interpretation on what a distillery can do. We will buy whiskey from distilleries that you know. We'll also buy distilleries, uh, whiskey from distilleries that you may not have heard of as much. But the whiskey we're going to try um, today is actually from the Glenrothes distillery, which is a very well-known distillery owned by Edrington in Speyside. And it's an 18-year-old Glenrothes um, from our authentic collection range. Now, we do different ranges of whiskey. Um, being an independent bottler is actually slightly ironic as we are dependent. We're actually dependent on distilleries um, producing whiskey and then making it available. Now, we buy like bulks of casks at a time. We're not just going to be like particularly buying a single cask. Sometimes we will, but the majority of the time we're buying maybe parcels of 20, 30, 40, 50 casks. And even, hi Snoops, and even um, like during the lockdown period there, you know, we were, I think we bought about like 200 and 300 casks, you know. Um, so we've got multiple distilleries casks as well. And when we're doing it, as Ollie said earlier on, not every single cask is going to be an absolute stunner. You know, in fact, a lot of the time, they're not the best in the world. So... Um, there's a time where you might be trying 20, 30, 40 different samples. And to be honest with you, there might be 20, 30, 40 disappointments at that time as well. But there's also the times where you'll get a range of samples and then you get one that's a really a real cracker. And we enjoyed this one with this particular bottling we've got up here from Glen Rothes. Um, it's one single cask, 18 years old, and it was bottled at 51.7%. There is a slight mistake on um, the on the pamphlet you have. I think it says 48 point something percent there, but it's actually it's 51.7. Now, this, uh, you probably see by the colour as well, it's pretty light. It would have been from a, a reused bourbon cask. Now, for something that's 18 years old, and I, again, um, I sometimes get a bit complacent by saying like 18 years old because we've got such a um, an array of stock that can sometimes seem young to like when we're some of the bottlings we've done in the past. But 18 years old is actually quite an old whiskey. And when you've got something that long, having something that's been in a refill cask rather than a fresh cask can actually be better because what it will do is it'll help mellow out over time. It's not just going to push too much of the wood influence into the cask and you're going to get more of the DNA of the distillery as well. Now, being a Speyside distillery, Glenrothes, they've got, uh, sorry, Glenrothes themselves have got their own bottlings, of course, you know, they're, they're ranged, they're 12, they're, they're 10, 12, 18, etc. But this one is one single cask and being an independent bottler, like all the guys here will tell you, there's no hiding place. You know, um, even if we do a range where we've got maybe multiple casks, it's still, the vatting of those casks is very little compared to what maybe a distillery will use, especially a large distillery, where they could maybe use hundreds of casks. You know, um, so if one or two or three or even 10 aren't so great, it won't matter, you know, because the rest will compensate that and it will help boost and enhance the flavours but we don't have any hiding place here. So when we're picking a cask, we've got to try and make sure it is of good quality as well. And we believe it is with this Glenrothes. Now, as the guys have mentioned earlier, tasting notes, it, it everyone has their, it's so individual. Everyone has their own palate. You know, it depends what you've been doing today, it depends your mood. But for me, this one, it's got that nice, nice kind of freshness, the, the, the sort of fruitiness. Um, 
and the palate as well has got that kind of it's almost the kind of pine that's too the almost the kind of like it's 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 got a nice sort of vibrancy as well, kind of zestiness. But if somebody tastes bananas or somebody tastes kiwi fruits and the other person doesn't, there's no right or wrong. And sometimes you can get a, a Jedi mind trick involved with tasting notes where you might not taste anything and somebody goes, you know, uh, almonds. Oh, well, yeah, I'm tasting almonds now. You know, so it, please don't feel that it's right or wrong. And even at this one, it's bottled at 51.7%. Now, that is like high to maybe somebody who's maybe not as, as no, who's not maybe tried as many single cast or cast strength bottlings. Um, but I also feel that it, it's it, it's not too high in alcohol. It's not, it's got a nice balance. Um, maybe somebody might like want to dry a drop or two of water, but to me, I think that's actually really good as it is. But never feel pressurized into thinking you shouldn't put water into it there's there's a lot of sides to to whiskey where some people feel that putting water into it's sacrilegious but it can actually help enhance and open the flavors and it all depends as i said before on your palate and it can change day by day but for me at the moment i feel this is actually this is actually gorgeous it's actually perfect just now and as you can tell it, it's you're going to put that in the market, you know. Um, it's not got, it's not got the color to it. You know, we 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 don't add any color. You know, there's no chill filtering involved. So this is literally just the cask we bought. We've done nothing to this. You know, this is as natural as you can get. We've purchased this cask many years ago. We've left it in our warehouse. We've tried it. We liked it. We bottled it. Um, we are very fortunate as well being uh, with Cadnades because we do have the ability with the, being sister companies with two distilleries we've got a lot of warehousing we also actually have a lot of access to to like buying other casks like as an empty casks too because when when you're buying a lot of these whiskies some of them aren't so great so we can then assess it we try and assess it at a certain age as well and also it's time dependent um you know, there's a lot of other factors in the job too, so we can't just sit around drinking whiskey all day, although it is quite a big part of the job. But, you know, you, you'll try some, if something maybe eight years old, you might take, I've said, just, just a distillery, just for instance, um, like Glenrothes, we'll maybe take 10 samples. You'll try a few and go, do you know what, that, that that's fine. Let's leave it. Um, it. We might not bottle it just now, but we can leave it, let it mature. We're happy with the progression involved. But then you might get one where uh, that's just something not right. Um, you can take the risk and leave it for another five, six, seven years. But if it's maybe 10, 12 years old at that point, you know, you, you've got to sort of ask yourself, is there going to be, is the cast going to do anything more to it? So that's when we'll take the decision to maybe stick it into a, a sherry cask or a rum cask or even just a fresh bourbon cask you know just to try and reinvigorate it try and give it a new sense of life um and also just sometimes to have a bit of, bit of fun with it um in fact in the last i think the last few months we've re-racked about nearly 200 casks but we've got a vast amount of casks that it's not a huge part of it you know that this is something we can have a bit of fun with and um, as Mark mentioned earlier on, you know, like uh, I've changed a lot of perceptions too because I always used to think that it has to be in a cask for a certain amount of time. You know, if you're doing a re-racking, we like put it into a sherry cask, for instance. But sometimes you'll get some sherry casks or some bourbon or some rum or some port casks that are very active. And maybe after a year or, or 18 months or, or whatever, it's actually, it can be very good and you can get a nice balance to it. But ideally, we try and give it maybe a second maturation of you know, up to maybe three plus years. But it, it just depends. And there's such a versatility with whiskey and there's each time you do it can be so different. The results you get, that that's a lot of the fun in independent bottling as well, is that we are going to give a different interpretation to what you'll get with maybe the standard range 
or in fact a lot of cases some of the distilleries we have you won't actually have heard of because the majority of it is going to be used for blending so we also get to showcase whiskey that doesn't get the same um the same focus as you'll see you know they, they don't have the marketing they, they don't um they don't get the same limelight as the big boys but there's a lot of good whiskey out there and it, it's fun and it means that every time we do a tasting it, it, it it's you know, it's something different. We're not doing the same whiskeys every single time. Hey, Sam, how are you doing, man? I'm having my Saturday night. Wonderful, wonderful. With well, Eddie and my whiskey family. Absolutely. Well, it's always delightful to see you. Sure. Well, you say up everyone's sweet. Let me just stop there. I think that these last two whiskeys show distillery character and that thing that only oxygen can bring. Uh, and uh, Cameron mentioned something about the delicacy of it, I think. Yeah, the oxygen, the slow, the slow mellowing of whiskey over time. And I think in, in a good cast, that's exactly what happens. Darkness is not about that at all. Darkness is about shoving your face uh, with, with sherry influence and with um, distillery styles. We, all the bottlings that we choose for this are uh, oddities. Uh, but let's, let's, let, let me start at the beginning, I think. Um, that's the way the bottle, oh God, that's the way the bottle used to look. You might be familiar with Darkness. It was sold through Master of Malt, Adam Brands. Ben came up with this idea because when we would have uh, whiskeys for that boutique whiskey company, one way to keep cash flow and also, you know, like Mark was mentioning, sometimes you get a cast that's just too big. You can't sell 600 bottles of Manic more. If we take 60 liters out, put it into an octave uh, that used to hold Pedro Jimenez Sherry or Muscatel or Oloroso Sherry, put in that other cask, it will take on a different flavor. And then you have also a different product. So you have two 12 year old Manic Moors, one in a brandy cask, one in an Oloroso cask. You can sell it as darkness, you can sell it as bajiki, you can sell it as whatever else you want to call it. Um, so that's that's where the idea came from. When I joined this company, and uh, I'm Sam, in case we haven't introduced myself yet. I'm the white guy with a beard, so I'm credible to be here. If <laughs> I'm obviously being facetious, and if you don't know me, get used to it. It's okay. Um, so when I joined Adam Brands after working whiskey, since I worked in Oddbins in 2002, uh, to working with the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, to working with Sukinder Singh in the Whiskey Exchange, uh, Douglas Lang, uh, and uh, the Balvenie, uh, with William Grandsons. I joined Adam Brands two years ago, just over two years ago. And one of the first things I wanted to do was sort of refresh this darkness range as a customer of it for a long time. I used to buy a lot of darknesses. I love the idea of making something unapologetically strange, you know, um, unapologetically in your face, higher strength, super sherry, not nuanced, not delicate um, for that occasion where you want something filthy. And I think I've spoken about this at many of these online tastings we've done in the past uh, and with friends and geeks around the world. Um, there is a time and place for that beautiful Glen Rothes we just had, with his, or the custard cream Klein leash, that clean distillery style and the beautiful influence of, of uh, American oak usually um, is a gorgeous combination. But sometimes you just want something a bit naughty. You want funk and nothing, few distilleries, I mean, we can say Campbelltown has a few, is spoiled for them. Um, but they're all over Scotland. Some of these, everyone needs a little filth. All you're absolutely right. So let's go to Inchfad then. So Darkness, we relaunched uh, really as this eight-year-old. I told you that's how it started when I got here. We redesigned it so you could see the color uh, as an eight-year-old, a distillery I can't name, but it is uh, a space side distillery with partial three times distillation and with worm tubs um, finished in Oloroso sherry casks. Uh, that's the core darkness. That's what we'll be repeating. But the one-offs, the things we'll be doing, that's what we're trying tonight. Inch Fat is one of the spirits uh, that is distilled at the Loch Lomond Distillery. Now, Loch Lomond is an underrated distillery, but I know we're not supposed to talk about Jim Murray. But some years ago, Jim gave uh, an award to a Japanese whiskey uh, as the whiskey of the year. And it became quite controversial that Japan was doing more innovation than Scotland. And if there was a one word answer to defend that, or I guess it's two words, it's Loch Lomond. Loch Lomond, um, first of all, inherited a tradition from Little Mill Distillery because of the ownership of using a different type of distillation, not strictly pot stills. They had columns sort of on top of the still or a series of plates. So you could create 
really a lot of different styles. So at Loch Lomond, I think they produce, someone's going to correct me, I think they produce nine different makes there currently. Um, I know when I got into whiskey in the 2000s, you could buy Inch Fad, um, but you, you soon after you couldn't. I guess it didn't work out, but you can still buy it as an independent bottler. We see it on the market. They use it for their blends. It's their PD expression. PD heavy uh, expression as well. So it's um, touched less copper as well. Um, so it has, as never mind before we put it in the, the PX cast that you have in your glass now, before that even happens, the, the distillery style already is sort of ripe pear. It's ripe fruits. So it's so close to Rancio, even at a young age. And that's fucking cool because that means you can manipulate the spirit to be able to pull out some of those flavors that you only get with oxygen and time often at young ages. So like 15, 14, 13 year old inch fads can be really massive. Uh, and so this one's full of cantaloupe when, when we had, when we got the sample, uh, full of cantaloupe, really ripe pears, like soft pears, ones that you just mush into your face. You know, I don't know how you eat your pear, but I take the top off and then eat it from the top, holding the bottom. But however you eat your pears, um, inch fad is, th this particular inch fad has been put in a PX cask uh, for six months where it, amplified those cantaloupe notes and amplified that sort of rotting fruit flavor, um, bringing out a bit of filth. And then there's a, a layer of smoke because it is, after all, the spirit is, is inch fat. So this, this is really a standout in the whiskeys you have tonight. I'm sorry for taking a detour. We didn't really speak about who was sending what, but uh, I'm still, I, I still think it's a nice break uh, from what we've been having tonight. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, that's the end of that Bahamas song. Doug. Hello. Good evening, my darling. How are you? I'm all right, honey bun. Yeah, I, uh, I've got to say straight off um, how much I've enjoyed everything that I've tasted uh, so far. Yeah, yeah. Absolute stunners, all of them. So well done to you guys. Um, yeah. You know, I think uh, it, it's just testament to the work uh, and the serious attitude of independent bottlers to really go the extra mile and find those special casks. Uh, so fair play to you. And uh, the water's quite nice as well, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, so, right. Um, okay, so listen, I'm going to let you talk for, uh, for well, for as long as you want, as long as it's no more than 10 minutes. Um, uh, no, I, could, I could do three if you want, but anyway, I, I probably wouldn't be fair. Um, <laughs> um, and, then we'll, and then we'll all get together at the end and have a, have a party. Yeah, it sounds, sounds like a good plan. Um, in case you, you don't know me, uh, many of you won't. Um, my name's uh, Doug or Doogie McIver, uh, Douglas when I'm being naughty, but only my mother calls me Douglas. Um, I've, uh, I've worked for Berry Brothers and Rudd for 19 years now, and uh, the, the tasks that I undertake for them is in um, buying casks, mainly of Scotch whiskey, but also other things such as rum, and uh, you know, instead of cognac, armagnacs, and bits and pieces, and um, we have a portfolio of um, other spirits. Uh, a very well-known number three, uh, London Dry Gin, uh, which is a, a prize-winning gin, which is probably our biggest brand. Um, but Berry Brothers, uh, for most people in the UK, if you say you work with Berry Brothers and Rudd, uh, they they automatically think fine wine. Um, because that's over the years what we've been best known for. But uh, spirits have actually played a key role in the success of Berry Brothers and Rudd as a company. Um, the firm was uh, founded back in 1698 by a lady called the Widow Bourne. And uh, Berry Brothers was originally um, a business selling coffee, uh, tea and spices and morphed later on into being a, a sort of general uh, provisions company uh, and then started shipping um, not only wine, mainly back in those days it'd be fortified wine, um, but also uh, you know it's some spirits as well. Uh, if we go back to the, the late 1700s, uh, in London the drink of uh, the gentleman was actually brandy, but throughout the 1800s a couple of things happened really. Uh, that uh, put a, a little bit of a, a stymie on brandy supplies. The first was the Napoleonic Wars, uh, which finished in 1815. And then, of course, later in the century, uh, phylloxera hit the, the French vine stocks. 
And uh, that meant that brandy um, was in shorter supply and um, the London merchants looked north of the border and the natural place to go was to find uh, Scotch whiskey. Um, back in those days, um, a lot of what was available was quite sort of rough and ready. Uh, and it wasn't really to the, the palate of uh, the, the London market. So with the advent of blending in the 1850s, it meant that uh, you were able to create something that was uh, softer in style. Um, but as a company, um, I suppose we, we started uh, shipping casks from Scotland and actually bottling in our cellars in St. James's Street in London uh, around about the sort of 1860s, 1870s. Prior to that, um, it had mainly been cognac. But um, with the, the advent, the discovery of uh, these uh, fantastic whiskies from up north, and if they were uh, matured in the right way, uh, they were a, a very adequate and sometimes a better option than what we'd been shipping from France in the past. Um, so we, we have records, uh, price lists, that go back to late Victorian times of um, some of the casts that we were selling uh, to our customers from the sellers at number three St. James's Street. Uh, things like uh, 1885 Macallans and Talisker's and Highland Parks and all sorts of, uh, you know, sort of really sort of top-notch malts. But malt whiskey didn't really uh, come into its own until about sort of 35 years ago, I suppose. You know, I've been working for Berry Brothers for 19 years now, and I, I'm one of the new boys. Um, I've got quite a few colleagues uh, that work in the company who have been there for sort of uh, more than 30 years. And I'm, I'm sort of lucky in the sense that I work with uh, two other uh, undisputed whiskey anoraks. Uh, one of them's name has cropped up already during our conversations um, with other guests this evening. Uh, Ronnie Cox, who was the, the global brand ambassador or brand's heritage ambassador for uh, the Glen Rothes single malt for many years. And uh, the connection there is that uh, Berry Brothers actually um, owned the Glen Rothes uh, trademark for a number of years. And um, Ronnie's job was to go around the world extolling the virtues. We then sold that. And the reason that we had a connection with Glen Rothes was that going back to the 1920s, 1923, Berry Brothers and Rudd um, created um, a, a soft style blended whiskey that was very approachable to um, the London markets, uh, the London taste, that it was designed to be a whiskey that was uh, easy to have as perhaps a, an aperitif style uh, or maybe, you know, something that was sort of softer to the London palate at the time. That was Cutty Sark, which um, we, we owned for many years and uh, at one point was the, the biggest selling blended whiskey in the United States. So whiskey has played a, a key part in the success of Berry Brothers over the years. It's a family company. Uh, since I joined, um, we sold Cutty Sark and then uh, we sold the Glen Rothes trademark um, back to the Edrington Group, um, who owned the distillery. Uh, and uh, since then, we've concentrated much more on what were our origins, really, which was as uh, independent bottlers, whether it was with cognac or, or whiskey. So um, I'm in the market every day looking for a cast like uh, the rest of the guys that you've been listening to. Uh, during the, the program this evening. Um, and I have to say, that I think everyone's mentioned uh, how friendly an industry this is. And we, we all rely on the big distillers, of course, but uh, we rely on each other because, you know, sometimes we can do a little trades together. If I've got sort of five too many of something and somebody wants a little bit of something that I've got and vice versa, um, we... We sort of keep uh, friendships and, uh, you know, the, the commercial side of the business going as well. You know, so it's not just about friendship. There, there is commerce. There are ways that we can support each other and other things that we, we do. Um, so I suppose everyone's sort of uh, revealed their philosophies uh, of uh, 
how they approach you know their selection etc and at berry brothers whether it's wine buyers or myself as a whiskey buyer sorry i, I forgot to mention the other um person um before i move on to our philosophy and uh, there's three three uh whiskey anoraks in the company myself included ronnie i've mentioned and the other one's johnny mcmillan uh who some of you may know uh, who's based up in edinburgh and uh i think uh if the prize for the biggest anorak of the three of us we call ourselves the the, the three dram eagles um if the uh prize went for the biggest anorak then it's, it's probably got to be johnny but um anyway going back to the philosophy um really really simple um we only bottle what we like drinking ourselves but there's a sort of four main criteria that i look for uh when i'm selecting whiskies uh it's balance complexity and uh texture which is really important and the third thing we don't really talk about age we talk about maturity of spirit because i've bottled some whiskies that were you know sort of four years old that were already mature and wonderful so don't let um age be uh, something that puts you off because some of these younger whiskies can be fantastic and equally at the other end of the scale um you will get something uh different from a whiskey that spent a, a long time in the wood uh, and sometimes that's something that you just can't get from younger whiskies and what we're tasting now um this is tomor which is a, a distillery in Speyside. uh this is a 26 year old it was distilled in 1992 this one's bottled uh, forgive me 45.2 percent which is the natural strength but it's come down to that strength naturally over the years sitting in the cask and we probably wouldn't have left it for far too much longer um, because we thought this had just got to a nice balance. Um, there wasn't too much uh, over extraction from the wood, although there are some oak tannin notes starting to come through, which you'll find in older whiskies. And it's not a bad thing as long as they're still in balance. So as we uh, look at this one on the nose, um, one of the first things that sort of jumped out at me was um, there's an element of uh, sort of linseed oil, but that subsides a little bit and then you start to get a lot of uh, uh, sort of tropical fruit notes. You get um, something like a sort of quince jam, ripe tropical fruits, and uh, even perhaps some hints of pineapple coming in there. And... Uh, I have to say this is what I get you know I, I don't expect you to get this because everybody's different and uh, I try not to sort of ram tasting notes and uh, as uh, somebody mentioned the power of Jedi um, you know uh, suggestion is not always a good thing I rather I'd rather that people sort of found out a um, what they got from the whiskey and, and B ultimately whether you actually like it or not you know but uh, on the palate, this is uh, this is quite a sort of long, lingering, chewy style of whiskey. It's delicious. It's delicious. It's like licorice notes coming through on the on the palate there, and there's a there's a little edge of something akin to uh, Sauvignon Blanc coming through. Um, I don't want to say the word um, cat's pee, uh, which was an allusion to uh, a novel written by Scott um, Fitzgerald, was that his name? Uh, the Great Catsby. But um, anyway, it, it's quite fitting that uh, a whiskey coming from uh, a well-known wine merchant has a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc uh, characteristic coming through it. But an older whiskey, and yes, obviously, uh, because it's an older whiskey, it would be more expensive than a lot of the whiskies that you've tried to date um sadly uh, the whiskey market is uh, even though there, there's more stock becoming available in the market at the moment uh that the price of um more aged casks is uh you know still extremely high um but we still think this is very uh, a good value dram uh, considering the age and uh, the, the the quality of the spirit so i i hope you enjoyed that now, um, Eddie, if you like, you can uh, abuse me for a few minutes. 
still so fresh, isn't it? I mean, for a 26-year-old whiskey, it's obviously not been in too vociferous a cask, so it's just it's just slowly, slowly, slowly got to its uh, kind of uh, tip-off point, if you like, hasn't it? Yeah, I think it was nice progression through the the different whiskies um, tonight. Um, good. Okay. Well, listen. Let's um, let's get everyone else back in because I'd like to get everyone. In. Well, listen, guys and gals. Thank you so much. That was great fun. Um, but let's uh, let's let's have a little chat amongst ourselves. Does anyone um, want to um, start with their favourite of this evening that wasn't theirs? No, it, it was um, the Marek Moore. I thought was the the most. With the most surprising one, actually, of the night. Uh, well, but like, you guys, I've had that. I've had that. I've had a lot of that manic more now, and uh, yeah, I can keep on drinking. I'm yeah. very yeah. happy. Yes, I think. It's, uh, yeah, the the Glen I mean, as well is sublime. You know, the, the, the Glen Leash is the 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 easy one to say that is your favourite because, like, if you don't like Glen Leash, you should probably give up drinking. Um, yeah, and, well. Um, the darkness is my friend. Um, it's this, this, everything was good. I, I, I would, I'm pretty sure the rest of the panel would say I'd quite happily bottle any of those. And I, I can't think anyone would, okay, I did bottle two of them, but that's two of them. <laughs> but, 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 um, in fairness, Mark, I tried to do one that I'd done, but for the sold out, so I have to go back to one of yours. Yeah, you had to go back to the site <laughs> that I didn't sell, eh? <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, but no. Um, I think I think they're all they're all excellent and bring their own individual character, which is which I think is something that Ollie speaks about a lot. Um, and I I think it's important. Yeah, yeah. Jess, I didn't see which one it was you held up. I couldn't see. I still can't see it. And well, you're on mute. Yeah, it's Hannah Moore. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have to say that Mark finishes are okay. The, yeah. the one I didn't want to like was was the inch fad. I didn't want to Sam, but it, it's a yeah. bit like SMN. I don't want to like it. But I kind of do. You know, every as, you know, you just every now and again a bit of leather. It's just, it's just Ollie, I, I have I have seen your search terms. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know what made me laugh is I was thinking about it, and I, and I was back with Dougie going like four or five year old lead check proper oily filth and thinking that's it's just the right thing to do every now and again you need that yeah well, someone, you need that filthy young drown are, are we in, are you live Eddie, or just live between us Sorry? <laughs> publicly live or just live we're, we're, we're still publicly live because i thought okay. that, right okay I to see how, <laughs> why how, what have we done wrong cameron <laughs> no, 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 no. I was going to say something else there, then I realized I better check that first. Oh, now you've got to say it. <laughs> Wind the bobbin no, up. No, no, no. I can't. I can't. <laughs> as, long as, as long as it's nothing derogatory about Mark. <laughs> I can't promise that one. No, Mark. <laughs> He's not allowed to say that by law. It's, 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 it's not. It's not. It's actually about me, but it's, it's, it's really bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, you've got to say it. No, I'm kidding. No, no. Dougie, no, guilty pleasures. It's guilty pleasures. Guilty pleasures. Dougie, did you, did you say the Klein Leash was your favourite, Dougie? Yeah, yeah. But I'm I'm very biased because uh, uh, Klein Leash and Khalil are my two sort of favourite malts. And the only reason I can say that is because uh, I've been in the trade for 30 years and over the years, they're just, uh, for me, the, the most consistent two um, malts that I just keep going back to all the time, and you rarely get a bad one. I think I think with Kalila, it doesn't matter how many times they knock the distillery down and rebuild it, they still make it good. Like, it's consistently good, and I think that's, you know, people speak about craft, because oh, it's small, it's great, oh, it's craft distilled. Yeah, it's made by someone who doesn't know anything. Um, but, you know, not all the time. I'm just, like, snagging people off here. But, like, what I mean is that just because something's big, like Kalila is owned by the dark side, you know, Diageo, et cetera, got to love them. But just because it's made by big people doesn't mean it's bad, you know. And I think Kalila is the proper anti-craft movement whiskey, if that makes sense. Like, Can I just say, you're really tall. Are you yeah. saying that because you're really tall? 
and you're like, big <laughs> people can make good whiskey. <laughs> it, it, the funny thing is that um, the the redeveloped Kalila Distillery from the late 60s, yeah, when they built uh, Klein Leash, they're built on the same blueprint, even though they're entirely different tasting whiskies. The distilleries are built on the same blueprint, so I yeah. don't know if that's got something. It's to say. Yeah. So, it's also the, even even like the the name they've got now, which is actually like from not, maybe not some of ourselves here, but like um, no, it's all the same thing. All the independent bottlers, though, like um, you know, like Kalila, like like some Mortley, Kleinleash. A lot of the sort of big names have came from the. The hype that's been brought up from independent bottlings because people have tried their whiskey when they couldn't have done it before and therefore they've managed to try whiskey that they would have normally tried before then they've went oh, this is pretty good so obviously the owners have went well let's try and like, like in the 60s like our bag for instance you know like, it was independent bottlers that, that sort of pushed the bottle for that they pushed the boat for that you know um our bag was getting Pushed to to everyone and nobody would buy it. Yeah, I mean, if oh, if, if you were to buy a cask, uh, like <laughs> you were to buy a cask, a uh, heavily sherry space whiskey, they'd say, "Oh, well, you take a couple of casks of that seventy four R big that no one wants." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. you know, and, and in years to come, we'll be saying the same thing. But oh God, why didn't I buy? And I'm yeah. not going to mention names, but you know, why didn't we buy that that everyone wants? Yeah. yeah. I, I still remember getting told by um, Andrew Simonton, I was asking him about, you know, deals you did that you were really happy with, deals you did that you didn't, weren't happy with. He goes, years ago in the, in the early 90s, I was sitting in a pub and I overheard a conversation with a guy going, I've got this fucking poor Ellen and I can't sell it. It's awful. <laughs> and he went, I'll take it. And it was all of those, um, the otter, you remember the otter on the label? Yeah, and, and you know, for years you had loads of cars. To, like, can you imagine someone rocked up in a pub today and went, "Yeah, I've got all this poor talent. I can't sell it." Uh, yeah, but then how do you how do you get people to like your whiskey? Close your distillery. It's true. He did also say that he <laughs> to sell it in the nineteen nineties. So you know. yeah. I, I mean, I don't have much stock, so there's no point in firebombing any distilleries anymore. But the rest <laughs> of you might have stock that are worthwhile. Yeah. If, if anything burns down in Campbelltown, Mark, we'll know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I was thinking, because Springbank's a little bit too close to my own house. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a long road, though, isn't it? You know. <laughs> uh, I did love what Cameron said earlier about us actually being dependent bottlers, that idea that we are so dependent and we didn't say it once tonight. And I, I don't know if anyone attended the virtual whiskey festival last week uh, and the weekend before, um, but sometimes independent bottles do need to sort of defend or, or build our own credibility. We didn't do that at all tonight. I think that's really great. We don't need to defend ourselves. Blenders don't need to defend themselves. There are different drinkers for different occasions. We're dependent on the big companies. Um, what do we have tonight? Manic Moore. We mentioned Mortlock, Glen Elgin, yep. Klein Leash. Yeah. These are produced by the big bad guy, but we're actually we, we we depend on that to happen. It doesn't mean that our, our independent bottled whiskeys are independently bottled whiskeys are better or worse. Um, we have a we have an audience, a fixed audience of geeks who will want to try that strange thing, but sixty million other people are drinking everything else. It works both ways, though, you know, because yeah. to the same degree, we're the we're the bad guys when when a distiller wants to talk about their brand and their heritage and their consistency, uh, we're the good guys when nobody's buying their brand and their heritage and their consistency. Because it's probably well, well, that's what I could have brought up. Between distillers and independent bottlers, we love them and they hate us. <laughs> that's not necessarily true. You know. Yeah, but, I don't think so either. There is. I, I, I mean, mean, I think... Uh, I think you just go through periods, as, as you say. You do. You go through periods where they, where we're really important, where we're not. Our job is just to find good whiskey. It kind of really doesn't, doesn't yeah. matter where it comes from or when it comes from, as long as it tastes good. The only thing I think that's a bit frustrating as a as an independent bottler is we're forever celebrating, or I feel we're forever celebrating change in an industry. 
we're we're celebrating development. You know, and some some people in this room have seen a bit more development and change than, than the rest of us, um, and can probably talk about that probably more precisely than I can. But you, when you go to the big distillers or the marketing companies specifically, and the big distillery companies, they never want to talk about change and development. They want to talk about now. And I think, in a way, that's really sad. Because Scotch whisky is all about change. It's all about spirit developing over not in cars, but distilleries, yeah. etc. And I'm, I'm I'm the same as you, Ollie, because I came from a, a sort of retail um, background, you know, going back to my days in Milroy's. And uh, you know, the, the 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 bigger companies were like, hugely supportive of us because we were hugely supportive of stocking their brands and you know selling lots of um, their product, um, and then sometimes, you know, because we ran a, a sort of small independent bottling business on the side of that back in the day, um, you know, they were very supportive to us as well. You know, um, so I think uh, the the industry as a whole, we all need each other. I think that's yeah, um, yeah. that's yeah. the message. I totally agree. I think one of the things I love most about the whiskey industry is it's a global industry, but it's tiny. We all know each other. You know, and we've all alluded to the things we've done with each other. And that sounded much worse than that, I meant, but, you know, we, we've ended up in compromise. Well, at least you said with and not to, Mark. I mean, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> but what, what I mean is, like, it's a global industry that goes around the world, but there's a group of it, particularly in independent bottlers, we all know each other, stick together, and, you know, we'll phone each other up in the middle of the night or whatever and it's you know it's quite normal and i don't think there's other industries that necessarily do that or yeah, i didn't tell I, him I, that it wasn't the middle of the night or mike and tell him it wasn't the middle of the night it was about it's, three it's normally the around about midnight to be honest <laughs> <laughs> yeah but the phone calls go <laughs> I just i did whenever i'm talking to mark i just want the, to be the last thing i do before i I had nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, listen, guys, we could go on all night, and we possibly will, um, but we're going to draw a close to the broadcast element of it. Um, so I just want to thank all of you for giving up your time this evening and for your wisdom. Uh, thank you to all the lovely customers for tuning in. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, folks. Um, it was certainly really good fun to to uh, uh, take part and, and host that tasting. Um, and you know, those those guys and girls are some of the legends of the industry. So um, it's definitely worth listening to them and and any tidbits that you might have caught um, in between the tastings. Um, anyway, that's it for this video. Um, thank you so much for supporting us and uh, by buying or receiving this tasting pack. We hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, please do tune in to other videos that we have online at the moment. And also please get involved in the tasting packs if and when you can. Thank you very much and see you soon. Bye-bye.